I'd share. He's like, here's crayons. Like, why are they in the church, right? Because we're all very colorful tonight, right? <laughs> A very colorful one, sir. Thank you very much. You guys doing well? It's Wednesday. It's hump day. <laughs> yes, I've had to actually work all week. <laughs> okay, it's all good. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> uh, I've been in in-service all week. Uh, no, I'll be here. But then tomorrow night, we got the parents coming. Woohoo! <sighs> so, extra prayers. Extra prayers for Providence Academy. Woo, we're starting out. <laughs> Do, and we are just, we're going to soar this year. It's going to be an awesome year. It's going to be awesome. I'm just sad that I don't have my summer off anymore and I have to go back to work. <laughs> no real sadness, sadness. I just, you know, I was getting a little lazy. But time to go back to work, crack that whip, and let's roll, right? All right, well, let's open up in prayer. You know, I, I just want to praise you, Lord, dear Father. I just want to thank you for all the wonderful things that have happened this week. And we just expect even more. And we just declare that there will be more wonderful signs and miracles that have happened through all of our lives. Because you are a good, good God. You are a good, good God. And, and we trust you and we trust what you say. We trust your word. And we know that through your power, you have given us the authority, and I pray that each one of us understand, get an understanding of that authority, Lord, that we can actually know that what your word says is that we're supposed to do that, and we just walk by faith and not by sight, Lord. Lord, we go to Ephesians 1.17, and it reads, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, and that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave to him to be the head over the things to the church, which is his body and the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we, we have just been talking and started in our authority. The authority that God actually gave to us. You know, we are, we are able to cast our imaginations and, and access power, not our power, but power through Christ so amazingly that he said he's, he brought us he told us that this is what we have. You know, we can do the same things he did, but we're going to do more. We're going to do better. We're going to be, you know, and when, when we were talking about water walkers, you know, Jesus walked on that water, and when Peter saw him walk on that water, Lord, if that's you, call me. Tell me to come out there. He said, come. Peter had one word, come. And he started walking, and he was walking above all. All the things that were trying to kill him. That storm was trying to take those disciples out, but he was walking right over the top. That's where Jesus wants us. He was walking over the top of that water, over all the problems that could ever come into our world. We just need to take our authority, listen to his words, and start walking on the water. Go right on over. So I just believe that we are all overcomers. It says we're overcomers, right? So if we're an overcomer, we should be taking that authority and taking our birth. That's our birthright. That's, that's the inheritance. We just read it. It says the inheritance of the saints. Who are we? We're the saints. That's our inheritance. We're an overcomer. And when we understand what the strategies are that Satan is dealing with us, we're going to start picking that apart, and we're going to just make him run. And 
Didi's favorite. We're stepping on his neck, and we're just choking him out. Okay. So, chapter 2 starts out with, whom he may devour. Amen. <laughs> when you yield yourself to sin, you're serving Satan, who is the author of that sin. But when you yield yourself to obedience, you serve God, who is the author of that righteousness. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Romans 6.16 in this spiritual battle, your actions are very important. Most people recognize that actions are important in the physical realm. You know that there are consequences for what you do. If you're speeding while driving, you could get a ticket or cause a wreck. Ticket could cost money and put points on your license. The wreck could damage cars or even cost someone their life. When we talk negatively about someone, we could hurt their feelings or even lose demonic powers against them. Loose, loose, I'm sorry, loose demonic powers against them. There's much more to life than just the physical, natural, surface level. Spiritual dynamics are constantly taking place. Whether or not the person you're speaking evil about ever knows it, you'll be affected. Venting anger, frustration, resentment, or unforgiveness affects you whether it affects anyone else or not. I've actually ridden with people who are very vocal in traffic when someone cuts them off. They've told me, that person doesn't know what I said. They didn't hear me. It doesn't matter whether they hear you or not. If you get angry or bitter, you've just yielded yourself to Satan. Whether you recognize it or not, the devil is the one who influences us to respond in the wrong way. I don't know about you guys, but I was extremely convicted on that last little bit. <laughs> And I thought, okay, i got to stop that. And I was chatting with my sister coming here, and we we got to stop that. We have to stop that now. You know, it's just one of those things that, like that fellow, I, oh, it's not hurting anybody. It's hurting me. It's hurting my relationship with God. And it's opening up a door I don't need open. <laughs> the wrath of man. James 1.20 says, The wrath of man worketh not a, the righteousness of God. In other words, giving place to anger and bitterness doesn't accomplish the righteousness of God. You aren't going to accomplish God's purposes by getting into the flesh, giving into anger, or losing your temper. That's not the way God's kingdom works. So whether anyone else ever hears you or not, what you say is having an effect on you. A fellow I led to the Lord some time ago was genuinely converted and had come quite a ways in his discipleship. He upholstered cars and was trying to restore a certain old one. One day I went over to his house and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. I knew he was home, so I walked around to the backyard. As I came around the corner of his house, I heard this awful profanity, screaming, and yelling. This brother had a fence post and was beating the fire out of, it, out of that car. He was cussing this car up and down as I, his pastor, came around the corner. When he saw me, he stopped for a moment, conviction, I presume, and said, well, it's just a car. It doesn't matter what I say to it. It didn't hurt anybody. I had to explain to him that it doesn't, didn't matter what it was. When you give place to anger and vent like that, Satan jumps on it like a chicken on a June bug. <laughs> the enemy will take full advantage of an open door like that to come and steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. James 3.16. Notice how this didn't say some evil works. It didn't say envying and strife could allow the devil to come against certain types of people. No, when you get into envy and strife, you're flinging the door wide open and saying, come on in, Satan, and do your worst in my life. You're drawing the big target on your back and saying, shoot your best shot. When you give in to envy and strife, you make yourself a target for the devil. Um, yeah, James 3.16, where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil works. Again, it just goes back to that, just opening that door. We need to change our attitude, <clears throat> change our words, because, because we are the righteous. We are the righteous, not because of what we've done, but by faith in Jesus and 
we are the righteousness of God, right? So just look at the benefits of the righteous, all right? Uh, Psalms 92, 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. I don't know about you, but I love palm trees, and I'd like to flourish just like them. Why do, why are palm trees so great? Dee Dee. <laughs> Slow on operators over here. Okay. In, this, in the storm business, you hardly ever pick up a palm tree because they're designed to bend to the ground. That's why you hardly ever pick one up. Nice. Nice. And this was an object lesson last year. And they're not only designed to bend to the ground, we're compared to the palm tree because every time they're bent to the ground, their roots go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And it, he likens us to, in one of the commentaries that I read that we're just like that because every time we go through a trial or a circumstance, our roots should go down deeper and deeper and we should get stronger and stronger and stronger in the Word of God. And I've never forgotten it since. Amen. Psalms one. Rivers of water. Yes. Because it's saying no matter what comes our way, our roots are so deep that we can never fail. Amen. That's right. Proverbs 11.10, when it goes, goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. So I think we need to have a little bit more of the righteous because our cities need to be rejoicing and not having all kinds of chaos going on, right? The seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Proverbs 11.21, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto the prayers, 1 Peter 3.12, for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, and will thou compass, compass him as with a shield. Can I read that again? <laughs> for thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, with thou compass him as as with a shield. Psalms 5.12. Harder than it looked. Anyway, here's one more. I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread? Psalms 37.25. Then the righteous shall inherit, inherit the land and dwell within forever. Psalm 37.29. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss any of these blessings. You know, the devil needs to turn and run, step on his neck, tell him to get out. You're an overcomer. You're the righteousness of God because we are. And not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ and the righteous which is of God of faith, Philippians 3.9. We've got that promise, and we should stand on it every day. We are the righteousness of God. We are righteous. And that's pretty cool when you think about that we're not perfect, but we are in his eyes. And when, they, when God's looking at me and you, who does he see? He sees Jesus. And that's our twin brother, right? <laughs> I love that. Are you spiritually stinky? Sometimes. <laughs> We are unto God a sweet savor, smell of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. 2 Corinthians 2.15. What is your spiritual sense? Are you giving off the sweet aroma of Christ, or are you spiritually stinky? Just like flies and rats, demons are attracted to open wounds and garbage in your life. Your rotten attitude, getting mad in traffic, being bitter over whatever, and criticizing everything and everyone is putting out an aroma that's drawing every demon in the country to your house. And you wonder, why am I having these problems? Mm -hmm. Why does nothing go right for me? That's just ignorance gone to seed. You need to recognize that we're in a spiritual battle. Your thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions are either releasing the power of God in your life or they're releasing the power of the devil. You might think, fate is against me. I have had bad luck. You may even put it off on the Lord saying, God, why have you allowed these things to happen to me? It's not like that at all. 
God is good, and he's doing everything he can to save, bless, heal, and prosper you. However, we do have an enemy who is going around looking for anyone he may destroy. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Notice that it's whom he may devour. Satan cannot devour or destroy you without your cooperation. One way he gains that cooperation is through ignorance. You may think that it doesn't matter if you get mad at the car you're working on or the driver who just cut you off in traffic. You might think that nobody's harmed when you gossip about someone who isn't there saying, they won't hear this. But the truth is, once you start venting these things, Satan takes advantage of it. For some reason or another, we feel like politicians are just fair game. We think we're free to say anything we want about them because the freedom of speech our country enjoys encourages us to voice our disagreement. However, there is a right and wrong way to do it. I've heard Christians rail on presidential candidate or some other public officer in ways that aren't healthy. You can disagree without putting a person to shame with the words you say. It doesn't matter whether they hear it or not. You could be opening up a door to the devil through your words, Romans 6, 16. We need to start walking through this world beyond reproach. You know, every, we need to be setting the examples. We need to be that light on the hill, that beacon in the night, because whether it's you know at work or school or businesses or wherever we are at, people are going to look at the way we live our lives. And even you know when we choose to have a God-filled life, and it's what we're putting in. It's down to what we're watching on TV even. You know, because if you've decided, like, okay, I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to walk in the gospel. And you're like, oh, but there's this show, and you know it's not good. You know it's not lovely. You know it's not it's not what we should be doing. It's, it's not what we want to put in our bodies at this point. And then we make a choice because they're little choices. Then they're big choices. And, and every time we make good choices, we build ourselves up that it's easier the next time because, eh, do we really need that in our life? You know, now, is, are we really going to be swearing at the driver that just swerved in front of me and almost took me out? No, we're going to pray for him. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do, I promise. I'm, you know, it's just, we got to set an example of faith all the time. And, you know, even Paul, you know, in Romans 12, 17, he was just saying, live above reproach. And wherever it is, people aren't going to forget an act of kindness, but they will remember a Christian that acts like, you know, they're better than they are, they're mean or cruel. They'll remember whatever. And as we teach our friends, our family, our children, it's something to just remember, to really live out what God says. Spiritual dynamics. You need to set a watch before your mouth, Psalm 141.3, and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5, you need to control your actions, Galatians 5.22-24, and recognize that the demonic, demonic realm is trying to take a shot at you every day of your life. If you allow a door to be open to them, they'll come in for no other purpose than to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. Remember, Satan is looking for whom he may devour. You need to learn to recognize the spiritual dynamics happening in your life. God wants you to yield to him so that his power and blessings can be released to you. Satan wants you to yield to him so that destruction and death can be released to you. Sorry. Um, in order to gain an inroad, the enemy is constantly trying to snare you with bitterness, unforgiveness, and ungodliness of all kinds. Therefore, no matter what you do, you're either obeying God or obeying Satan. You're either submitting to God and his influence or to Satan and his influence. Every time you act, you are releasing spiritual power, either God's or the devil's, into your life. Since most people are ignorant of this truth, they allow all kinds of things in your life. Yet if they were to recognize the results they're going to recap, they would never allow these things. At one time, the the wife of one of the Bible college students was suffering from severe depression. When I began to tell her how she could be delivered from this, she explained that she had battled depression since she was a little girl. She'd seen through the period of one or two months each year 
where she would be severely depressed and have to treat it with medication. When I told her, you don't have to live that way anymore, you need to get over this, she answered, this is just the way that I am. It's not hurting anyone. I get over it. Everything's okay in a month or two. And she totally accepted and embraced this depression, thinking it was only a passing thing that had no lasting impact. But every time we submit to doing things Satan's way, we are having spiritual relations with him which conceives evil. It just isn't benign. You know, <clears throat> it says that we can, man cannot serve two masters. And sometimes we're serving our thoughts. And those thoughts are not good thoughts, or they're thoughts of the doctor who brings us a bad report, or it's thoughts of, you know, financial ruin or whatever. We don't need to be thinking like that. We, we've got God's thoughts. I mean, it's, you know, we have the Holy Spirit to strengthen us when we're down and just to stir up our spirit. You know, we can be around people who are like-minded, that have faith, and bring us up, and maybe not talk. And just listen, listen to their faith, and just, again, get your spirit stirred up. You know, also, praising. You know, we should have praise music and for all that he's already done. So that's something we got to just really change our thoughts as quick, you know, capture every thought and, and change it right then. And don't let it fester. Because, you know, I think fester is not going to be good. You know, um... Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. Isaiah 55, 7. Because there's just, we need to be delivered from our problems and we're not going to get delivered by talking about it and talking death over it. We need to speak life every single time. Sin's conception. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. Sin is conceived in your emotions. Every time you have a negative emotion, whether it be sadness, anger, fear, strife, or one of the many others, you conceive something. Many people are conceiving things that they don't want to birth. They don't want depression, strife, suicide, or their marriage to fall apart. Yet they allow these negative emotions to flow through them without recognizing that we're in a spiritual battle. When you give in to your flesh and start saying and doing these things, you are releasing spiritual forces. There is a battle raging and the enemy is looking for an opportunity to come against you. The devil's will is to devour everyone he can. 1 Peter 5, 8. He desires to steal, kill, and destroy every person everywhere. John 10:10. 10, 10. If Satan got what he wanted, then the whole earth would be devastated and there would be no good anywhere. However, God has a will too. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. Jesus is trying to release life into you. Satan is trying to steal, kill, and destroy anything good that you have. Both are willing and able to move and manifest those things in your life, but the determining factor is you. You need to recognize this battle that's raging and the fact that everything you say and do is either empowering God or the devil. The Lord, wa the Lord wants to release this life onto you. Satan wants to steal that life and kill and destroy you. It's not fate or luck. Your thoughts, choices, and actions make a huge difference in your life. How does the devil see you? Hmm? What? As a threat, you know, that's the way he needs to see us. I mean, there's too many people that are terrifying. Where is your armor? You know, and all those Roman soldiers, they didn't have armor in the back because they weren't running away. They weren't, they were charging for We need to be, again, on the offense, not the defense, you know. And, and the reason why the Israelites were so terrified, you know, when they went into Canaan, they had every, they had God behind them. Go in there, take that land. And then those 12 spies creep in there. And 10 of them come back and go, oh, there's giants, there's giants. We're like grasshoppers. Okay. I mean, that would be probably terrifying if I saw a 9 to 15 foot giant or larger. I would probably be a little scared, but that's not what really got them. 
What really got them is because they viewed themselves as grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. You know, David killed, he killed Goliath. That was no big thing. And he was ready for his brothers too. That's why he had the extra rocks. He knew he'd take them out of the first one. He just, in case his brothers ran after him, I'll take them out too. That's our attitude. That's what we need to change. We've got to stop thinking that we're grasshoppers. That's what will defeat us. And we should never be defeated. Because we're what, Pat? Fearless? Well, fearless, but I was thinking when you said that, well, yeah, we shouldn't view ourselves as grasshoppers. If we're the righteousness of God, Amen. whoa, that shouldn't even enter our thoughts. That's just we just be meditating. We are the righteousness of God. We are not grasshoppers. We are going to take this land by force. We're taking our country back. You know, just like Didi was talking about, that pendulum swinging this way because we're praying. We're taking this country back by force. We'll take it back from the wicked. That's what praying Christians do. We come together as an army. We're God's army. We're His hands, His feet. We're taking. Every inch. And we may have to claw and scratch to get that back. Or do we? Or do we just need to speak that word? Speak that word and we have taken it back. We are getting it back. It is turned around. It is finished. It's done. We all declare right now that we have our country back. Amen. And this world is changing because all across the world, there are people coming to Christ and this is going to be big. It's going to be very big because Christians are going to be lifted up. And we're, com we're coming after the devil. He better look out. Um, in some, I think it's 105, it was um, God increased his people greatly and made them stronger than the enemy. Amen. Amen. We are stronger than the enemy. Why? Because God made us that way. Get out of my life. I visited a church once they had previously believed God could heal, but that it wasn't his will to heal every single time. What I didn't know was that less than six months before I came, they, it, they had changed their mind to come into agreement with the word, saying, it's God's will for every person to be well. He heals all the time. This was brand new step of faith for them. The congregation was beginning to hear the word and starting to believe God for specific manifestations of healing. Two days before I arrived, that church had a funeral for a 17-year-old uh, boy who had died after being in a coma for six weeks. The entire church had fasted and prayed, trying to implement the truths from God's word that they were being taught. Although they knew it was God's will to heal this boy, he died anyway. The outcome caused a tremendous amount of conflict, turmoil, and questions in that church. After the morning meetings, I went out to eat with the parents of the boy every day for three days, trying to figure out exactly what had transpired. <clears throat> Since everyone had given it their best shot, doing everything that they knew to do, many people in the church were beginning to back off the word, saying, maybe it's not God's will to heal every time. When I told them that wasn't true, that God had already provided healing and it's his will to heal every single time, they responded, well then, what's the problem? As I talked to the boy's parents those three days, I discovered that they had been in so much strife that they were about to get a divorce. They'd already made the plans and had talked about it with the children. So there was much strife, hurt, and negative emotion in that home. On the morning of the tragedy, the mother had an argument with this boy and told him, I hate you. Get out of my house and never come back again. She probably didn't mean what she said. She was just getting it out of the heat of the, out in the heat of the emotion. I know that kids can sometimes get on your nerves. I've raised some myself. Raising kids is harder than raising the dead. I've had to do both in my family. I'm not trying to condemn this lady, but before this boy left, she said, "Get out of my life and never come back again." There's really no words sometimes for something like that, you know. And that mother said horrible words that she'll regret and not be able to take back. But again, we're, we're the righteousness, and we have to step through that. And that's a very, very difficult thing. But those offenses that come, 
And Satan knows how to push those buttons. It pushes us just as hard and as far as we can actually go. And then once we get to that edge, we say something horrible. And they open that door. And what is that verse? Where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. You know, that's, a, that's just a horrible time that, that we have to understand that we need to really chew a lot on our words before we actually spit them out because we need to think about what we're saying because words are things and it's very powerful. Every evil evil work. Because the boy had been hurt by his mom, he violated school policy that day, left the school grounds, and went over to another kid's house to eat lunch. While there, they got out a gun, were playing with it, and the boy accidentally shot himself in the head. That's the reason he had been in a coma for six weeks. The parents just didn't understand how this could have happened. The word reveals that where envying and strife is, Mm -hmm. there is confusion in every evil work. James 3.16. Many people say, I agree that strife isn't the best. Nobody likes it, but it's just a normal part of life. Families fight, and then they get over it. Without realizing that we're in a spiritual battle, they just tolerate different levels of strife in their life. The word says that envying and strife bring confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33 If God isn't the author of confusion, guess who is? That's right, Satan. The devil is the one who, wherever envying and strife are, brings confusion in every evil work. When you fling the door open like that to the devil, don't be surprised if you see different forms of sickness, tragedy, poverty, and death manifest. Satan jumps on opportunities like that and uses them as inroads into your life. As a roaring lion, he's constantly seeking whom he may devour. And when Satan comes and tells you lies, you need to just throw the word of God back in his face every single time. Stand on his word. Scream at him to get out. He's got to flee because you're the righteousness. God and he's got to go and you've got to just sometimes get angry and tell him to get out because I think he just keeps poking you until you think oh I'll just like that woman she said oh I'll it's it's not that it's benign it's not it's okay no it's not okay because the next time he's going to hit that door harder next time he's going to come after instead of just with the stick hitting you, he's going to hit you with a log or he's going to be, throw you a big rock or he's going to come after you. That's what we have to stop it every single time. Renewing your mind. We've talked about that so many times, is renewing, stopping it, telling him to stop. Use your authority. Use it over your children. Use it over your family, your husband, your wife, your business. We have got to stop this now. And when we all start using our authority, that pendulum does move and it stays over to the right side to buy God. Because if we're walking with God, we can't be skirting way to the edge going, see, how far can we get over here? No, if we're walking with God, let's walk with God. Let's act like God. Let's speak like God. Let's, Let's do the signs and miracles that God has intended on us to do. We have a part to play, and this is part of it. We have got to stop being These mousy little Christians, we need to be bold. We're the lion, not the devil. We are the lion that's going around looking for someone to help save, to get to fill with the Holy Spirit, whatever it is. That's our job. We have the Great Commission. This is not this is not a time to sit on our hands and and just wait for him to come in. We've got to start now and get fired up. Fired up? All right. You know, now we're gonna get fired up with. You know, my, my good friend, Dr. Dalla, <laughs> holla, holla, because doctor's in the house. But <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a little bit more of, you know, winning the battle against Satan. because this grace is sufficient for me, because Satan cannot defeat a person who knows about this grace. Now listen to me carefully. The devil 
can only succeed in your life. This is strong. The only way the devil can beat you and be successful in warfare against you is if you are performance-centered, if you are self-effort-centered, if you are under the law centered. That's the only way Satan can have success over you. That's the only way. The only way Satan can have success over you is you're not submitted to grace and you're submitted to your self-performance, your self-preservation, your self-righteousness. The only way that Satan can win is to get you to thinking like those under the law thinks. Under the law, this is how people think. You got to do this in order for God to do that. Under grace, people think like this. God has already done it, so believe it. So if the Satan can get you to thinking, as soon as you go to, I got to do these things in order to get God to do these things, Satan can, can get success. He can have victory. As soon as you lean on your self-performance instead of leaning on what God has done, Satan can have victory. Success comes as soon as you go to self-effort, self-performance, self-righteousness, self-preservation. You know what he's saying here? As soon as you go to start trusting yourself instead of trusting God, Satan wins every time. Satan wins every time. So what we got to see right now is, is what is it that's under the law when you're under the law, and what is it that's under, under the grace of God? I'm talking about the law of Moses. When you're under the law of Moses, the law of Moses just basically says, you got to do this in order for God to do that. If you just read it, the law of Moses says, if you do this, then God will do that. I, just read it, read it. If you do this, then God will do that. If you do that, then God will do that. If you don't do this, then God won't do that. If you don't do this, then God won't do that. It is the, it is the pattern of the law that says the things, the good things are only going to happen when you do something, which is an offense, I think, against heaven. Jesus did all the things he did, and, and you are still saying uh, you, you, you're not enough. You're still, you're still saying, no, 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 I got to do this in, for, in order for this to happen. I just can't believe you. You, I, I, you got to do other things. You just can't sit there and believe him. <laughs> oh, my God. Somehow you're thinking you're greater than him? Oh, so you got something that's greater than what Jesus did? Oh, you, you, you got something that's greater than the blood? You got something that's greater than what Jesus has offered? You, 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 you're trying to finish work that Jesus has already finished? How many days are you going to wake up trying to finish something that he's already finished? You're trying to get healed when he already finished your healing and made it available, and all you got to do is believe you receive? You're trying to finish deliverance, and he's already delivered you? I mean, what does that look like? You know what you're saying? It's like spitting in his face. It's such a dishonor for you to proceed to try to do something that Jesus has already done. And every time you do that, you lose the victory, man. So what's under the law? The law is what you do for God. Under the law, it's about what you do for God. But under grace, it's what God does for you. Under grace, it's what God does for you. Under the law, it's what you can do for God. And religion is riddled worldwide about what you can do for God. And you're not hearing anybody preach. No, no, no. We're not under the law where we're trying to do something for God. We're under grace where we are grateful of what God has done for us already. Under grace, it's about what God does for you. It's what God has done for you, what he's done and what he does for you. And your faith reaches out and takes a hold of it. And the devil can't win. Under the law, the law is you working for God. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Look at all the years you come to church. It's all about you working for God. And sometimes people have used that to manipulate you. Satan uses the law to manipulate you. So under the law, it's about you working for God. But under grace, it is God working for you. Think of that, child of God. Under grace, it's God working for you. And when you're submitted to God, and when you believe in what he's done, it's about God working for you. But when you find yourself working for God, you're under the law. Satan wins every time. When you are focused more on what you have done right or wrong, listen to me now. 
when you're focused more on what you have done right, what you have done wrong, how many days have you laid in your bed thinking about, I did this wrong, I did this right, trying to figure out, well, I did more right than wrong? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? When you're focused more on, on, on what you have done wrong and, and right, then you are performance-centered focus. And when you are performance-centered focus, Satan will have success in any warfare against you. Just by getting you to lay there and just start thinking about, all right, I did this right, I did this wrong. And then saying to yourself, oh, my God, God's not going to do this because I did that wrong. Oh, but maybe God will do that because I did that right. And that ain't how I do it. That's not how that works. You're not righteous because of all the wrong you did, and you're not righteous because of all the right you did. You're righteous because you believe Jesus. It's his righteousness. When are we going to get that? It's a slap in his face when we keep trying to work for our salvation, and Jesus has already done everything necessary for you to have that salvation. On the other hand, if you are performing before God and, and conscious of your performance, if you're performing for God and you're conscious of that performance, think of that, man. You're performing before God and you're conscious of the performance, then you're under the law. I'm performing, trying to get God to do this. And, and then I'm conscious of it. Oh, was it enough? Oh, I'm going to go out and I'm going to win. So win a whole neighborhood. Oh, but what is it enough? See, if you're performing before God and you're conscious of your performance, then you are under the law and Satan wins in this spiritual battle. You see, people under grace are conscious of what Christ has done for them. They are conscious of what Christ is doing for them. They are conscious for what Christ will do for them. And that's our mindset. My mindset is when Satan tries to, when he comes under attack, the first thing I do is that I remind myself I'm under grace. I am conscious of what, the first thing I do, I am conscious of what Christ has already done. And I, I'm not thinking about what I got to do. I'm conscious of what he's already done. You see, God's doing. It's God's doing, not your doings. It's God's doing, not your doing. Religion is all about your doings. But Christianity is all about what God has done. The deal is that the devil will get you every time you shift to self-effort. Every time you shift to self-effort. In this spiritual warfare, he gets you every time. You know what? Not only will he get you when you shift to self-effort, but then he'll condemn your efforts. <laughs> Look at what you did. <laughs> Every time you shift to self-effort, he condemns you, and then he condemns your effort. Look at what you did. Check out what you did. And you sit back and think about years of what you did and have him sitting there condemning you. Eventually, you got to understand the condemnation is designed to get you to the place where you're not believing God. He's got a strategy against you. He's going to pull up all your stuff, all the stuff you should have, you should have. Listen, listen, I'm going to say this right now. I'm off, I'm off, off, off course just a little bit. Let me say this right now. It's time for some of you to put some of that, that, that shame and guilt and condemnation, and you need to stick it in a pillowcase and tie it up and throw it in a river somewhere and let the river take it far from you. Because every time that stuff comes up, that's his strategy. That's how he strategizes against you to win in this warfare. It, it's the strategy. You know what he's using now too? Religion. It's a strategy to try to get you not to believe that and receive what Jesus has already done. That's just too simple. I mean, that's just, that's just, that's just too simple. <laughs> Jesus said, my yoke is easy. <laughs> and he's winning. And he keeps bringing up the guilt of something, the shame of something, because you won't believe what he's already done. And you don't have confidence in what's already done. And, you don't, and you're not leaning on this grace. You're leaning on the law. And Satan continues to try to get you to shift to your self-effort. He will cause guilt and questionings. That, that's, that's the strategy of the devil. Guilt and questionings. Now, I didn't say ask a question. There's a difference between asking a legitimate question and questionings. You know, when Mary got pregnant uh, and she asked the Lord, you know, 
how shall I get pregnant? And he says, by the Holy Ghost. That was a legitimate question. But then what some people say, if God was God, then why did my mother die? You know, you remember Mary and Martha? Uh, you know, if, if you were so awesome, then why did my brother die? That's questioning and doubt. What you're really saying, you're not asking the question, why did my brother die? You're saying, I doubt you now because you, you let my brother die. That's questionings. And so what, what Satan will do is, man, he makes a living off that, the questionings. All right, I heard God was so good, but if he's so good, then why did that happen? You're not asking a question. You're questioning the legitimacy of the promise. Yeah. Satan does that. Well, if, if, God, if God is so powerful, then why did I lose my job? If God's so powerful, then when I prayed hands for them and they had COVID, how come they died? That's questioning. Let's just call it what it is. It's doubting. Let's call it what it is. It's, a, it's fear that what God promised won't come to pass. Strategy of the devil. He's been studying you. He's got a file on you. And in some cases, he keeps using the same old files over and over again because you've not grown up to, enough to recognize how he operates. Guilt and questionings will constantly be a part of what he does. How many times have you read your Bible today? That's the devil. How many times have you read your Bible today? Now listen, read the Bible but if you don't, that shouldn't make you feel guilty. It should just, it means you're hungry, that's all. <laughs> Think about that. I hadn't read my Bible today, and then he's saying that so he can get you to feel guilty. But when you're relying on God, you're like, oh, I hadn't read my Bible today. Oh, I'm hungry. Let me go read my Bible. You got to recognize the strategies of the devil. You can't base your trust of being accepted by Jesus Christ on your performance or on what you do. I, Jesus didn't accept me because my performance was awesome. It, it, it was awful. Jesus didn't accept me because, you know, all of the wonderful things that I was doing. I wasn't doing a lot of wonderful things. Jesus accepted me because I believed. You got to understand that you can't base your trust of acceptance on your performance or what you do because the devil will get you every time. Every time you, if you base your healing on your performance and what you do, you're probably going to end up dying. If you base your prosperity and your provisions on your performance and what you do, it ain't nothing going to happen. I'm giving you an answer. You want to know why it hadn't been working? Because you've been working. <laughs> you want to know why it hadn't come to pass? Because you just won't simply submit yourself and let God be God in your life. You remember this scripture? Be still and know that God is God. And we won't do that. We won't be still and know. As soon as something's going on, we make a big old long list of all the things we need to do in order to get God to do something for us. You know, 1 Peter chapter 5 and 8, <clears throat> if you go there real quick, it, it I was like, oh, okay, I'm still into it. I'm still writing down. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've listened to all of it a couple times, so I forgot where I stopped it. Sorry about that. Anyway, what, did you, what were y'all thinking when he was talking about the strategy on, on the devil? I mean, has he ever come after you? Does he not know what your weak points are? You know? When he comes after people, we got to stop him in his tracks. Because he knows that I may be a little fearful of this or that. Uh, but I'm telling you what, I am not afraid of spiders, so, and I've done my share of spider killing lately. So you know what? There's some things he can't get me on. We have to be really forceful. You know, we can, we can laugh, but there's, there's things that he knows you're afraid of. You've spoken that word somewhere to your friend, or you've been talking on the phone, and the little gremlin was listening. He doesn't, the devil doesn't know everything, but he hears what you say to other people. He hears what comes out of your mouth, and that gives him everything he needs. He gets his ammunition. He gets his queer, that little quiver full of arrows. And, and when you're not looking, boy, he just starts just shooting those fiery darts. Just goes right at you. 
because he knows what you're afraid of because you said it. And then he didn't hear you stop him when he started pushing your buttons. So he just kept running you over. And pretty soon you're laying down on the ground bleeding and you're just thinking, help me, Lord, how did I get here? And the Lord says, get up. You're an overcomer. You're the righteousness of me. Get up and just run him down. So run him over, boys and girls. Run him over. I'm telling you. <laughs> All right. Do y'all have any comments? Do you have any testimonies this week? They, they pushed me back to school. And I'm telling you, I've had, I had to go kicking and screaming a little bit. And there was a little bit of that, uh, oh, I could just want to murmur and complain a little bit. And I thought, i got to bite my tongue because it's, it's not a bad thing. It's all good. I'm just, I just had that little, that little devil going, oh, wouldn't you rather be here? Well, yeah, I'd rather be there, but that doesn't mean I'm not in a good mood. I'm loving all the people I'm with. I'm loving my new school. Kids are going to be coming soon. You know, it's like change your attitude. So they didn't give us lunch for three days. Okay, whatever. I was a little hungry. <laughs> they were kind of like a little lacking on that, but they wanted to get all that good stuff in. So you know what? We got all that stuff in. You know what? It's it's okay. I think I can miss a few meals or eat less. <laughs> you know, we just gotta be gotta be happy sometimes. Sometimes we just gotta be happy where we're at, and just be at peace and be at rest. You know. Well, why don't we pass this around? We'll start this with right here first. Well, we're able to give at this time. And I just like the fact that we can give, and, and he'll give right back. He gives it back to us faster than we can give it to him. Amen? Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you. Father, we just give you all the glory. We thank you for this opportunity that we can sow into your kingdom, Father. And we come before you tonight in gladness and cheerfully to give to you tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Take communion. You know, it's, it's, it's a time of just reflection of what he did for us. And, and again, just to be still and know that God is there, that he is working on our behalf all the time, all the time. And when we're singing and we're praising, you know, he's, he's helping somebody. He's saving somebody. He's healing somebody. He's always working. And he was beaten and broken and bruised so that we didn't have to be. So we can just take and receive what he's already done. That atonement was special, special. Let's just take this and remember what he did. Take and eat this. the blood is so special too just the thought that his blood is running through our veins right now it gets rid of all the sickness and disease and any kind of pestilence or or any kind of germs anything that's coming over everything it's just gone it can't touch my body it can't touch your body and this blood that comes through us run it out we need to really think about what this blood is when we cover the Whatever it is, and we cover it by the blood of Jesus, it's done. It has flipped that over. We need to just know it, see it. See it in your mind. When you drink this, I want you to just see it running through your veins and clearing out anything that's bad or ugly or negative or anything that's unfortunate. Just let it get it right through your system and get rid of it. In Jesus' name, let's drink this and remember him. Because I am the righteousness of God, and I am going to take all those blessings. I'm going to take everything that God wants to offer. I want to take it every day. And if I forget it, you know, that's, that's why we sit around people of faith. Because sometimes we ever forget.
We need to listen to you, you know, the others. When I hear somebody talk about, oh, this is a good testimony this week, you know, I am overjoyed because now it just stirs up my spirit. I'm like, oh, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. I want to, I want to be at that point where every day I'm stirring up my own spirit. Speaking in tongues is great. It just edifies you more. And we all need to go to that, those high places, those heavenly places, and we need to sit quietly sometimes and just let God be God and listen to him so we know what to do. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We glorify you. We lift you up because, and just bless you, O oh Lord, because you have blessed us abundantly. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, chapter 3. Chapter 3.